Hello, welcome all. Welcome to my live stream for today. Thanks for joining me. And today's going to be a cool drawing day, I think. Uh, we're just going to do some straight up caricature drawing, which I haven't done in a while. We've just been doing some other interesting things, I think, the past few weeks. But today we're going to get back to basics and just start drawing. Just do a thumbnail sketching, start the caricature process from the beginning. And this time it's going to actually involve uh, the body too. So Hello, we're going to welcome all. Oh. Welcome to my live stream for today. Don't want to hear me Thanks talking. For joining me. All right. So and yeah, let's take a look and see who's in here today. Hossein, uh, hello. Some straight up Greta drawing, from Copenhagen. Nice. We've just been doing some uh, hi, Red. Sergen Dirk. Good to see you all again. But today we're going to get back to basics. Hi, Valerie from France. Bonjour. Drawing. Just do a thumbnail sketch. Uh, Luis, hey. Hola, pinche gringo. All right. And Keys, hey. Good to see you. So yeah, so we are going to draw All right. So yeah, let's take a look uh, today a uh, picture today. of Zane, hello. Let's see if I can reveal it here. This guy from Copenhagen. Clint Eastwood from this exact picture too, uh, actually. So he is uh the man with no name. If you're not familiar with the spaghetti westerns, uh you know, it's the movies that made Clint Eastwood famous, I think. And if you've never seen any of the spaghetti westerns, I really suggest it. They're, uh, I'm not a big fan of older movies in general, uh, but the spaghetti westerns were really cool. Um, it was sort of the first time in filmmaking, I think, I don't know, I'm not a huge film buff, but uh, where you really get like just a badass anti-hero, and it just changed filmmaking, and you get to see a lot more of that after uh, Clint Eastwood made it popular. Uh, yeah, but the, the good and the bad and the ugly is probably one of the best. And if you've never um, seen it, it's a long ride, movies, though. You know, really it's it's a long movie, a, and by today's standards, the pacing might seem kind of slow. Uh, but, the but there's so many really just great cool. moments of um, just yeah, you know the badassery, filmmaking, whatever you want to call it. And uh, it's something that uh, uh, is really creates these iconic images in your mind. And when we all think of Clint Eastwood, we think of those images. Filmmaking, and you get to see a lot more of that after Clint Eastwood made it popular. Uh, but um, the good and the bad and the ugly oh, is probably okay. one of the um, best. Okay, let's see what's going on there. <laughs> okay, um, how about now? Um, yeah, testing one, two, three. You guys, do you still hear that? Oh, let's see. There's always something, isn't there? Um, I only got one mic going right now before I had two. Let's see. Does it sound okay now? St still multiple sound? Is it good now? Okay. Okay, real sorry about that. Probably really uh, frustrating. Um, yeah, I'm not sure what... You know, when these things happen, who knows? Uh, as you can see, I've uh, updated my uh, ability to do live stream chatting. Uh, I figured out how the gamers do it with the transparent overlay, so that will be uh, on our screen when we're drawing. But anyway, let's go ahead and uh, we'll go ahead and get uh, get to it here. All right, so I'll be drawing today on this paper, which is, in case anyone is is interested, uh, a little bit of vellum here. Uh, this is my Canson vellum, 55-pound uh, vitilon, I guess. And it's sort of a translucent paper, really smooth finish. Uh, really nice to draw on. It takes the pencil really well. And I'm starting with some H, go to HB, then some Bs, some of these guys. So... You probably all have these simple materials at home. Anyway, yeah, so if uh, if I decide to edit that part out with the uh, crappy audio, uh, just to repeat myself a little bit, go see, you know, figure out a way to see some of the spaghetti westerns. Good classic imagery there. Uh, some standards of filmmaking were established in the spaghetti western genre. And I'm not a big fan of older movies, like I said. I, uh, I generally like newer movies. But uh, those old uh, spaghetti westerns were pretty awesome. And since uh, Ennio Morricone just died a week or two ago, I figured it would be a good time to do something like this because he you know, did the score. Uh, anyway, so I'm going to be working from this photo here of Clint, classic image from uh, near the end of the movie during the standoff. I won't tell you much more than that. Uh, but uh, I love the pose here. It's... Uh, in this picture, it just shows like this contrapposto classic statue of David pose almost. Uh, like Michelangelo's David. And uh, he's looking right at the camera. We've got a great view of his face. Of course, the lighting isn't awesome in this. At least it's not super conducive to drawing. It's gonna. It's a lot of half tones, no strong shadows. Uh, but we're going to try to make it work. Just trying to pull out the forms through the half tones rather than through strong shadows. 
Now Court will start doing gameplay. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I'll be doing some Legend of Zelda playthroughs soon. Uh, all right. Anyway, um, let's go ahead and get started here. What I want to do first is do some uh, sketches for the face, do some thumbnail sketching, and uh, figure out exactly the level of exaggeration I want to do. So uh, I'm just going to start with sort of a, you know, it's just what I have in my mind, you know, an idea about what, how I to exaggerate his face. It's not, a, I don't want to do a super literal translation of his face. I want to do kind of a strong exaggeration. And I, I, I just keep on with Clint. I see this hammerhead sharks, you know, face shape or ET face shape. And, uh, you know, and it's probably just maybe psychological. I've seen a lot of other artists draw him this way, probably. You know, he's heavily, heavily caricatured individual. So I might be drawing from the collective unconscious here, but, you know, I'm going to definitely have my own spin on it because no artists, no two artists can draw the same exact caricature twice, right? And I just want to get the essence of his likeness, this scrunched up, squinty, squinty eye. Just keep it real simple, simple statement at first. And I really find myself, I have more successful, loose thumbnail sketches when I just do this scribbly type movements. And I don't think too much about it. I just let my hand just sort of go. And uh, just very, I want it to just flow out of me, just like I'm not thinking about it. It seems like his eye on the right is a little lower, a little more angled than the eye on the left here. So I'm going to keep that in mind as well. Uh, let's see, uh, Ninja Nate. Yes, I will be doing a full body caricature, but, uh, what I usually like to do is do the figure out the face or the head exaggeration first, and then I focus on the body once I've figured out what to do with the head. And I treat them separately. I don't, I don't usually do them both at the same time, because if I were drawing the body on this, the head would have to be pretty small, and that might limit my ability to figure out what to do with the exaggeration. You know, I don't want to, like, uh, lock myself into too small of a space while I'm trying to figure the head out. Because the head and the likeness, I think, is the most important. And then uh, once that's done, I'll, I'll probably start on a new piece of paper and uh, do the body. Red says, this is, from what I understand, the most crucial stage. Uh, yeah, I think so, because this sets the tone for everything, this thumbnail sketch. When I say thumbnail sketch, you know, it's, that usually refers to just a small, quick sketch that you just try to get your ideas down on paper as fast as possible without too much um, fuss and, and without worrying about anatomy, without worrying about, even not, you're not really even worrying about likeness so much. I mean, you do, that is the goal, but what I'm thinking about more here is the level of exaggeration and how much exaggeration I can get away with. see that you know the jawline or the lower part of the head just transitioning directly into the neck And just firm up a couple of these ideas. I, I like what's going on here so far. Uh, I just want to maybe refine it a little bit more, but not too, not too much. These thumbnail sketches, you don't want to spend more than, you know, three, four, you know, maybe five minutes on one. And he's got, you know, these great crow's feet on the outside. That's going to be definitely a feature. Okay, so that's a good, simple start there. It's like sort of a triangular-shaped head. Um, now the goal here is to just come up with a completely different head shape, if possible, and see what else I can do with it and still make it look like him. Uh, and 
you know, it's a good direction to go in. I like what's happening here, but I don't want to repeat myself because I don't want to get just locked into one mode or one thought process for how to solve his head. There's got to be multiple ways to do it. So let's go still kind of long and tall, but let's not go wide on the cheeks here. Let's just, you know, it's maybe a little more boring, but you know, you never know really it's gonna, what's gonna work until you get it down on paper. Hossein says, I want to buy an Intuos Pro. You recommend small or medium? Whoops. Um, I always recommend getting the biggest you can afford. Um, however, my very first tablet, you know, my first drawing tablet, uh, Intuos, was, you know, four by five inches, something like that. It was really small. And I did several paintings on that, mini paintings for a few years before I got a bigger one. Probably about five or six years I used that. Um, but I, I was much happier when I got a bigger one, let me tell you. <laughs> Um, Louis says, what do you think about X, XP or X, yeah, XP pen tablets? Um, I, I've never used one. Um, I, some of the, you know, lesser known tablet brands like XP and I think Huion is another one. Uh, people seem pretty happy with them. I think they, everyone acknowledges they're not as good as Wacom, but, um, but it definitely can get the job done and at a fraction of the cost. So that definitely is, uh, something you might want to consider. But yeah, don't take advice from me on that because I just I've never used the uh, other brands, so I, I I can't really compare. I don't really have a an informed opinion on them. So I repeated some of the same things, like the same kind of relationship from the eyes to the nose, uh, this sort of a long, thin nose, but the head shape's very different. Uh, not, not such a big as fan as this one, of this one. But let, let's do another one and see what else I can do with it. Uh, see, Tom Richmond did a Clint caricature, which appears on his book cover. Might be that he used the same reference? Yeah, probably. This is a real famous film still. Um, so yeah, that's probably. Uh, Matt says he used to have an XP Pen Pro 22, but it had very bad parallax. I replaced it with Wacom. Way, way happier with that. Well, there you go. There's someone who's used both and has an opinion. So yeah, the parallax can be, you know, where your pen tip looks like it is versus where the cursor is on the screen. Because of the thickness of the glass, it'll be a little bit different. Um, and Wacom has tools to help you, uh, you know, part of the driver is to help you compensate for any parallax. But the newer ones, uh, the newer Wacom models also have a thinner glass, so there's just less parallax that's going to happen. Uh, let's see. Antonio says, one of the things I admire most about you is your speed. You work really fast. Well, thanks. Yeah, this stage I really do. Yeah. Uh, does anyone, does anybody have experience with small tablets? Yes, yeah, so if anyone can help Hossein with uh, uh, suggestions on smaller tablets, like Intuos tablets, feel free to chime in and let him know. Thank you, Paco. Okay. Let's see, what else can I do with him here? Let's go, I don't know, let's, let's do something totally just not intuitive or something that I wouldn't normally do. Let's, let's go with maybe a narrow upper face and a wide lower face. Just because, you know, it's just because it's different and unexpected. And it's not at all what I really want to do. So I'm, I'm not holding out high hopes for this one. <laughs> uh, but I wanted to try it because, you know, I don't want to just, again, repeat the same uh the same exaggerations over and over again. The stage is all about experimentation, taking chances and risks because these are just little throwaway sketches. They're not important. You're only spending a couple of minutes on them. So, uh, yeah, that's you know, with the nose. If the cheekbones are really are down really far down here, the nose is going to have to be super long, to you know, because they they have to sort of correspond to each other here. At least that's how I like to draw my caricatures.
And it doesn't matter how neat or messy these marks are. You just want to get your thoughts down quickly. That's why I'm sort of drawing this way with the side of the pencil. Okay, yeah, yeah, this is definitely, I don't know, this is not going to work out. But I'm going to still try to finish it. <laughs> but it's, uh, yeah, I can tell already this is not going to be a successful exaggeration choice. But I want to give it its due, you know, I want to do as much on it as I did on the other ones as far as trying to bring it to uh, some kind of finish. If I narrow the jaw a little bit, that might help. Just make the cheekbones the widest part of the face. Nope. <laughs> uh, I'm glad I did it, but yeah, that's definitely not an exaggeration choice that is going to work with, with Clint, I don't think. Something like this might work for someone with a really heavy lower face, like someone maybe a little overweight or someone who's you know a lot older. In this picture, Clint's pretty young. He's sort of a young man, and younger men tend to have narrower jaws, you know, because they have less facial fat and less jowls. But Clint really never really got to that stage anyway. He never gained a lot of weight or anything. So he still has that young man's face. It's just maybe gotten longer and craggier. So I can probably fit something in up here. Let's move this over to the left a little bit so the chat doesn't cover it up. Okay, let's just try like a cylinder. Just a long cylinder. No cheekbones to speak of. Just a long tube head. Looks like Bob Dylan, yeah. <laughs> BR says, since I try kind of exaggeration, is difficult to reset and try another one. Yeah, that's uh, it's true. Once you get a successful likeness or something like a good attempt on your first try, it's hard to veer off from that. But I think it's important to definitely give it that go. Just go in a direction that you're not confident in. Because you you, you never know. You might surprise yourself. I think nine times out of ten, your first instincts, instincts are probably right, and you should probably develop those. Like I could, you know, probably going to develop this one into a more finished rough sketch. But uh, again, I just wanted to show how I like to experiment and my, what my process is. Also, don't fall in the trap of going too fast and sloppy with these. Uh, because then you don't really think about what you're doing as much. And uh, you're, you're less likely to get a likeness because you're just not treating it with any kind of uh, diligence or respect. you got to definitely still try. You know, Try to keep the same level of attention to this fourth or fifth sketch as you did to the first one. Let's go with like a longer filtrum area here. Uh, I caricature says, is it better to improve my sketch before moving on digitally? Um, well, whatever medium you're working on, um, or you're working in, you definitely want to um, yeah, improve the sketch at each stage. You know, you don't want to start pouring a lot of time and effort into a any sketch that isn't resolved as resolved as it can be for that particular stage. Um, so, so you know, like. I don't want to move on with a likeness I'm not totally happy with and an exaggeration I'm not totally happy with at this stage. I mean, the likeness can be improved. I, I shouldn't say you have to be totally happy with the likeness at this stage. Uh, but it has to be sort of a funny, dynamic exaggeration. You know, as exaggerated as you can get, really, if that's your, if that's your thing. If, if exaggeration isn't your thing, maybe you don't need to worry about that at all. Maybe you can just do more of a portraity type sketch. But I think most people want to achieve a, a pretty decent level of exaggeration. So yeah, this... Just remember the goal for this stage is exaggeration choices and figuring out the head shape. The next stage, the rough sketch, as I talk about in my Proco course, is about resolving the likeness. And then the stage after that is about resolving the anatomy, the perspective, the construction of the head with using techniques like the abstraction. So at every stage, I develop it a little bit more uh, in certain areas. I focus on one or two goals at each step, and then I move on to other goals for the next steps.
Hey, Maria, you love this. Amazing work. Going in direction not confident in. Yeah, that's, you know, because again, who cares about these sketches? They're not, you know, I'm showing them to the world here, but normally you don't. You just sketch in your little sketchbook, trying to figure out what works. You don't commit to more than like a few minutes on each sketch, so nothing's really lost, uh, and you can have a lot of fun with it. Uh, Luis says, are you going to finish the drawing in Photoshop? I don't know. Well, we'll see how it turns out. Um, if I really like this and I think it has a lot of potential and the final drawing turns out really well, I, you know, I, I, sometimes I turn those drawings into uh, paintings, like oil paintings or watercolors. Uh, I caricature says, I only do sketch caricature. I want to move digitally since it looks like it's more presentable. What do you think? Yeah, I mean, the next level, if you just do quick sketch, especially if you're a theme park artist, like how I started out, and if you want to move to the next level, to me, that has always been uh, doing illustration and fine art style caricatures, and then with, with that comes, you need the ability to paint somehow, whether it's digitally or some other color medium, but you need to be able to do finished drawings that you spend more time on, because now you're working towards a portfolio and towards, you know, you want to attract the type of clients and art directors that will want to hire you so you know it has to be at a certain level you know so uh however if your sketch goals or if your goals as a career are just maybe to be a really great quick sketch artist and maybe you want to open a lot of caricature stands well maybe now is not the best time to think about that with the world closed down but uh, there are a lot of people i know who focused on that you know opening a lot of booths and stands at retail locations and they're very successful and have can, can have very fulfilling careers without necessarily being an illustrator or a painter all right. Maria says, hey, Court, have you thought of doing like to compete with Tom's Daily Caricature? like every day you post a celebrity and everyone in the group tries to do a caricature based on the things you've taught? Um, you, you know, that it's, I think Tom's maybe a little more organized than me. I don't really I haven't really thought about doing something like like a challenge myself that I lead. Um, this is just my way of sort of connecting with everybody and keeping people busy and drawing is just doing reaching out with these uh, uh, with these live streams. Okay, so I think I'm going to go with this uh, one here, like my initial instincts uh, had me do, because, you know, that's that's an e immediately what I went to, this sort of classic triangular-shaped head. And uh, I don't need to trace it. I think I'm just going to, you know, just, re just redraw it. Let me get a fresh sheet of paper out. Whoop. Sorry about that. Better double check the camera, make sure it's in a good place here. Yeah. Uh, I caricatures caricature says I improved my caricature because of your videos, especially when you were in Proco. Thank you. Uh, so Br says I like the first one with stronger jaw, like in the second and a smaller hat. Oh, okay, good, thanks. I'll keep that in mind, too. Yeah, so maybe he could use, I think, some kind of jawline. But if you look in his reference photo, I mean, he has a really narrow jaw. It's, it's, it definitely lends itself to a triangular-shaped head. At least, that's how I see it. If you're thinking more literally about the face, yeah, there's definitely a jawline there that's more squared off. But in caricature here, you know, you take what's in front of you and um, make it, uh, you know, I, I just try to make it more of what it is in what it is is I don't see strong jaw lines, so the jaw kind of just takes a back seat, and I don't uh, really see it. So I've, uh, I'm working with an H pencil now. It's, it's a little lighter because I want to be able to erase it easily. Uh, hopefully you can still see that on the screen. Uh, I'll darken it up pretty soon, though. Hossein says, do you ever went with weaker exaggeration just because you thought the first one looked like someone else? Uh, yeah, I mean, I sometimes wimp out on my exaggerations, especially on a quick turnaround job or for an art client, uh, for an, an illustration, or even a commission client where, especially with commissions, you know, it's tough because I think most people don't really want strong exaggerations. They initially think they do when they contact me, but when they see my sketch, they're like, oh, it's not as flattering as I thought it would be. So I end up toning down my commissions quite a bit. So I've done a lot of commissions that I've never actually shared with anyone because I'm not very happy with them personally. I think they just satisfy the client's needs, but I'm not really proud of them for, as an artist. Uh, so I have very few commissions on my uh, shown on my website because there's very few that I 
was really happy with. I mean, I think they're fine sketches, you know, the ones I do for my clients, but they're not, uh, again, if I was doing them without any input from the subject themselves or from the person they were commissioning it for, then yeah, they would probably turn out a little differently. Valerie says, can I learn to draw caricatures even if I'm not good at drawing portraits yet? Yeah, definitely. Yeah, um, I mean, I was not good at portraits. You know, I'm still struggle. I still struggle with real portraits. Um, but like, yeah, 20 some years ago, 24 years ago, when I started doing caricatures, I mean, I definitely was not good at traditional drawing at all. I didn't have any really good schooling at that point and didn't know what I was doing, but I picked up caricatures pretty well. But when I did start to learn how to draw portraits with better methodology, it, it helped my caricatures a lot. And Red says, is this now the stage where you develop the likeness? Yes. Yeah, so I'm just trying to reproduce what made the um, the uh, thumbnail sketch successful, and I'm trying to build on that. Um, and maybe it gets toned down a little bit here from the initial thumbnail sketch, which had a you know a narrower jaw area. I'm maybe widening it a little bit now here. So I'm I guess you know you might say watering it down a little, and that's I think just natural inclination because you know I'm focused more on likeness right now. But my initial approach is kind of similar to how I do it. It's you know still scribbly and loose. I I, I want to keep that energy going, that that spontane uh, spontaneous quality. I did like the longer fill trim on him too. Um, just that works really well with his likeness because he has a longer fill trim. That's that space between the nose and the uh, and the mouth. He's got this small, uh, tiny cigar or large cigarette, one or the other, <laughs> in his mouth here, which is helping his sneer, that snarled mouth look. His mouth cracks open just a little bit at this far side, at the, the side that the, he doesn't have the cigarette in. It's a kind of a funny hat he's wearing. It's sort of uh, it's sort of tall in the picture, but if I make it too big, it's gonna look like a top hat, and it won't quite look. It'll just look wrong. So I think I'm gonna flatten it out, make it a little shorter. It also helps mimic the shape of his cheekbones here. It's sort of a mirror image of that, which is a nice sort of rhyming visual image. Although if it becomes too <laughs> noticeable, if it becomes too much of a distraction, I might tone down that mirrored effect. Um, See, so he has ears too. I, I don't, I'm always torn on a face like this if I should show the ears because they end up just looking like little bobbles hanging down below his cheekbones, but I don't know. If, I think if I shade and draw them correctly, they should look like ears or they should look enough like ears. Let's see. Um, Herman asks, how much importance do you give the props like the hat and the cigarette? Well, like, yeah, you probably wrote that before I started talking about it. But yeah, that's, I do think about it. It's, uh, it is pretty important. Everything in the picture really is important. The hat maybe is not quite as important as getting the likeness in the eyes and the nose and the mouth, but it definitely is strong secondary importance because if it's too goofy or or out of place looking, then it just, it's going to ruin, you know, every image is only as good as its weakest part. 
And if the hat was just ridiculously large or too small, or it would just be distracting from the main image. And uh, at that point, it becomes super important because it's something that's ruining an otherwise good, uh, good caricature. And they are sort of symbols or icons of this character, so they are pretty important to include. And again, not to have them be distracting. I want to capture the innate quality of that thing. So, for instance, you know this what he's smoking, like I said, it kind of is either a large cigarette or a small cigar. Um, so I wouldn't want to do a gigantic cigar because as cigars go, it's really small and thin. And if I was going to do some big Warner Brothers, Bugs Bunny cartoon cigar, again, it would just sort of throw everything off and be distracting and it wouldn't be reminiscent of what's actually happening uh, with the likeness. Okay, so yeah, I like where that's going here. I'm going to switch to a slightly darker pencil and refine this a little bit more. It's, it's, it's just a really generic looking right now. It's generic Clint Eastwood. Now I need to focus a little bit more on the features and make them more specific to his likeness. Let's see. Maria says, Proco Caricature Facebook group. You can post your caricature practices there. Yeah, uh, did someone ask about that? Maybe. Uh, Hossein says, I wonder why someone like you or Jan Optibik draws live caricatures. What live caricature can teach you? They are fun, though. Um, yeah, live caricatures, I think, taught me how to break down and analyze a likeness really quickly and to have confidence in what I was doing. It helped me teach me really good line quality because when you're doing quick sketch caricatures, your line work is basically all you have to express yourself. You're not doing a lot of shading. I mean, you, there are certain sketches where you might color them in. But uh, your line work is paramount, and it helped really helped me teach good line quality because of the markers we used. Uh, let's see. Alexander says, thanks for sharing your knowledge. I've watched several times almost all your videos, and because of this, my drawings have improved. Thanks. Uh, I have troubles with ears on wide cheekbones, too. And German says, hey, Court, a double question. What's your favorite Clint Eastwood film, and how do you pick who you are drawing? Um, you know, probably my favorite Clint Eastwood film is... Uh, the one he directed, uh, well, he's directed a lot, um, and I love him as a director, but Unfor Unforgiven from 1991, I think, thereabouts. Um, great, great movie, and it's kind of like the culmination of this character, like, as he ages, the consequences of living a life where you just kill and kill, and it's it's sort of the weight of all those deaths sort of weigh heavy on him, and uh, I like how they explored the psychology of that, and it was just just cool. I mean, he was still badass in that movie, but there was a lot more depth than any of the other earlier movies he had done. Uh, I Caricature says, hey, Court, is there a way for me to show you my caricature? Just give me a critique and advice. Uh, yeah, yeah, I'm happy to always give just a quick advice. You know, if you show, uh, again, yeah, upload it on YouTube, not YouTube, sorry, Facebook to the Caricature Proco group and tag me in it and ask for advice. I'll give you some advice there. Or you can also try and email it to me, but... Um, you know, if you want, you'll get more critiques from me and maybe other people if you do it on the Facebook group. Okay. So I'm going to switch to more of an overhand grip now so I can get a little bit more control. And use the pencil more on its tip rather than on its side. Still want to be sort of fast and um, you know spontaneous with this. I don't want to get too wrapped up in uh, you know everything like the anatomy and resolving everything just yet. This is really just about refining the likeness. So if it's a little um, asymmetrical or uneven or the construction's a little bad, I'm going to worry about that in the next step. Which which I won't do that next step today. I'm I want to move on to the body after I get this done. Uh, and most of you are probably familiar with the steps anyway at this point if you've been watching my videos, you know, how I like to, you know, I'll do a tracing of this perhaps in order to do an abstraction of it to try to figure out where it could be improved. You know, flip flip it into a mirror version of itself to see uh, where some of the inconsistencies and problems are. Yeah, this, this eye on the right is definitely more squinty and angled down a little bit more. I'm going to zoom into my photo reference a little bit too here so I can see his face since I'm really focused on that right now. Alrighty.
So this will be the cast shadow on his forehead here. The brim should be, the edge of the brim is going to be up here. Let's see who else is talking here. You messaged me on Facebook, but I haven't replied yet. Oh, you know, I, I just checked this morning and I didn't see any new messages. Um, yeah, I don't know. Uh, if you send it to Court Jones Studio, that probably work out better. I think with my if it's my personal profile, I think those go into a folder that I never see because of just how Facebook treats messages from people who aren't Facebook friends. Um, yeah, sorry about that. Um, or you could try emailing me directly. Just go to my website and there's a form there or my email address is written on there too. Uh, but I apologize. Um, Luis says, do you have upload caricature videos? Oh, oh, you're writing to someone else. Okay. All right. Yeah, you see what I mean about the eye now? Yeah, when it's closer up like this, it's really, uh, really asymmetrical actually now that uh, I have a good look at it. The lighting is pretty tricky on his face here because, you know, he's on a movie set and he's wearing a hat. So he's got these weird, I don't know, weird shadows being cast on his face. Like there's a shadow coming off, you know, there's a light off to his right side, I think. Or maybe it's a reflected light from a, you know, a film reflect, you know. They have these giant reflectors to shine the sunlight back into the subject's face. So that's there. And then there's this weird, weird shadow and light area on his beard on the left-hand side. Um, I'm going to probably ignore that because it's so strange. It's like a cut line. It's such a strong line. If you notice where his beard and his cheek meet on the, on the left side, it's probably just because of the brim of his hat is casting a shadow. And then there's all this weird reflected or fill light on his face. So it's one of those things where you have to make a judgment call on how you're going to handle that sort of thing when the, uh, lighting is less than ideal. So yeah, the shading on this, the cross hatching, and whatever I'm doing here, it's a, I'm just gonna be it's sort of a simplification of what's there, but you have to sort of simplify and make your own uh, judgment calls on how much rendering and you know where the shadows are going to fall on the face. I mean, I'm gonna try to be honorable to what's there, you know, try to be true to what's there, but um, odd little things like the you know, a cast shadow on the cheek, yeah, that's, that's going to be sacrificed, I think, just for the sake of uh, visual clarity. Atlee says, it's getting late here in Norway. Wow, thanks for staying up for me. I appreciate that. Um, let's see. 
You're going to watch it tomorrow. <laughs> yeah, thanks. Thanks for joining. Um, Ninja says, would you ever do a study of Tom Richmond? Like a, a drawing of Tom Richmond? Yeah, I mean, I, I don't recall ever actually trying to draw Tom. He did draw me once, painted me for a cover of uh, the Caricature magazine back in 2005. So, yeah, I guess I owe him one. Uh, let's see. Owen says, do you have a beginner's book in PDF that one can download? Uh, no, I'm afraid not. But, again, if you're not familiar with my Proco Caricature course on YouTube, I mean, the, it's all fundamental lessons for the part one of the course. Very basic stuff. It's like basically this uh, procedure that I'm following right now, this multi-stage process of developing it from a thumbnail sketch for the concept, then refining it throughout, you know, with the stages after that. So definitely check out the videos. Um, you know, some people maybe learn better from books. I personally like watching videos and demonstrations more than art demos and books. Paul says, I uh, hope you're doing well. How do you choose who to caricature? Uh, I don't know. It, it varies. You know, sometimes I'll find just a photo that's really inspiring one day. And I say, oh, yeah, I got to do that guy. Um, or maybe I'll see a movie or, a, you know, something will inspire me like a character. And uh, I'll be really motivated just to draw him because of that. Because it's just because like, I like the show. Like, uh, like after I saw Breaking Bad and was done with that, I'm like, yes, I got to do a Walter White caricature just because I like the show so much. So it's just whoever inspires me. I mean, whoever, um, you know, whether it's their fascinating personality, a talented actor, um, or it's just sometimes because it's a necessity, like drawing Trump. <laughs> you know, he's the president and he's quite a character, so it's you really got to have one in your portfolio. And for years I avoided drawing him too, you know, too much. I sketched him a little bit over his term, but I finally did one a few weeks ago. Uh, Hossein says, I believe if you look really carefully and it's time you absorb things you need to from another artist's artwork. You don't need to actually copy. Am I wrong? Does the act of drawing it again teach you something? Um, yeah, uh, are you asking about drawing other art, redrawing other artists' caricatures, like master studies? Uh, if that's the case, then yes. I mean, that is one of the things I always encourage people to do because it is very, very informative. If there's someone whose work you really admire, and you want to figure out how they did those shapes, just try to do those shapes yourself. Re recreate one of their caricatures, just freehand. Try to draw what they drew, and you'll start to see about just how crazy some of those shapes are that they're drawing that maybe you, you were too timid to draw. And I experience that a lot whenever I do master studies, especially of like Jan Optobiques or uh, well, like Anthony Geoffroy or Kruger. Uh, yeah, Tom Richmond does have his caricature book you can buy or download. Um, Yukinam says, what do you consider cheating in art? Um, well, tracing photos, I don't know. <laughs> um, you know, there's everything that has value, I guess. Um, and there's there are definitely different ways to cheat the system or... I don't know. When, when, I, when you say cheating, like to me that just means cheating yourself out of the experience of learning and growing from that act. So you can definitely do things that are workarounds, especially digitally. Um, but sometimes cheating, you know, the things that some artists might frown upon is just a necessary step in in your development. Maybe you trace for a while because you want to learn painting and you want to paint a good painting. So you don't want to, say, focus on drawing in that particular lesson. So you might project it and trace it onto a canvas or a paper and then paint it uh, after that because you want this lesson to be a painting lesson. And that's per that's valid. You know, I think that's a good way to go because you're more motivated and you're more likely to finish that painted study if it's drawn from a, uh, you know, a really good reference photo and it looks good. But if you have really poor drawing skills and uh, and you still want to do a painted study, um, you know, you could just trace something down and uh, draw it. However, just be aware that whatever medium you use in art, you know, to paint, you're eventually going to cover up that drawing and you still have to draw it, basically. So I think people that do that will still have a hard time. It's not going to be as easy as you think just, you know, tracing something uh, for a painting. But you do learn other things in the process, you know, not, you know, everything you do in art has some value, but you can definitely 
you know, cheat, just be aware that you're not, you know, you're going to put, you know, put yourself further back than other artists if you don't go about things in a more straightforward and honest way. Uh, yours turned out good, thank you. Valerie says, is there a big difference between your free videos on Procos and the premium videos? Yeah, I mean, for one, there's a lot more videos in the premium section of the course. You know, there's, I think, I don't know, I haven't really counted, but I think there's like 50 or 60, 40, 50 videos maybe on the Proco playlist for my caricature course. And there's like 131 or 100, yeah, something like that, over 130 videos in the video, in the uh, premium version of the course, which are basically additional demos. And the pre the the primary lessons, some of them have longer versions where I go into more details on things, especially the lesson on the uh, the Riley abstraction and caricature. There's a lot more to it than I go over in the uh, in the free videos. But however, you can get I think still the core lessons, the core value out of the course just by watching the free videos. However, if you really want to go more in depth and understand the principles more and see more examples of me using it on different like celebrity faces uh the premium lessons will have that So now I'm just adding some uh, crosshatch shading just to help define the, the planes of the face a little bit more, uh, to give it a little more visual interest, and to just refine the idea some more. Like, uh, yeah, just things just need some further clarification before I can totally decide on if I really like this likeness. I think generally there's more shadow or just slightly darker tones on the left side of the face here because of that aforementioned uh, reflected light or indirect light hitting his face from the right side. So yeah, there's this, you know, just slightly darker half tones over here than there is on this side. When working from subtle photo reference lighting like this, it's important to really analyze what's going on to help you figure out the course of action in your drawing. Otherwise, you just may fiddle around this drawing just completely lost, not really knowing how to make the forms look three-dimensional. Because when there's not strong lighting and strong shadows to tell you, it's it's kind of harder to, to uh, pull those forms out and make them look convincing three-dimensionally. sort of this uh, very uh, sunburnt, weathered look to his face. Okay, I think at this point I really should switch to a uh, darker pencil. This is the B. Oh, this is a B? I need something a little darker than that even. Um, whoop, dang it, I keep on doing that. Working in a tight space here. Okay. Um, oh gosh, this is like, a, this is the, the next darkest pencil I have is a 7B. I don't even have a 2B. I really need to get some new pencils. sharpening okay so just I want to give this just a little bit more punch visually let's see Herman asks um, did you ever have a celebrity reach out to you after seeing their own caricature? Um, no, not to me directly, no. 
Um, well, George Takei did uh, retweet my uh, caricature of him uh, just on his own page, which was great. I think I got a few followers out of that. I forget what he said. He had said, said some clever remark about it, but he didn't reach out to me directly. He just reshared it. Um, let's see. Louis says, you're right, I prefer the videos because I did not understand much with the PDF of the Riley method of your course because my first language is not English, but I congratulate you that the course is. Okay. Uh, Debbie says, yeah, the premium course has handouts too. Yeah, that's uh, true. Yeah, there's downloadable things and diagrams and whatnot. Uh, thank you, Patrick. So I do talk every now and then about um, making sure your drawings have good structure. And in the next stage of this process, I would focus more on that in case there are any weird inconsistencies or asymmetrical features. However, it's important to try to maintain the, uh, the choices that are intentional, like the asymmetrical eyes is something I would want to preserve and not you know, fix or make it even in my, uh, in my final drawing. So just keep... Keep aware of that if there are things like that that you want to preserve because that could end up watering down the likeness if you don't pay attention to that sort of thing and accidentally even them out. Looks like the cigar is uh, casting a bit of a shadow on his face here. Like so. Of course, if it's handled wrong, that would look weird, so i got to be careful about that. And things like the stubble, I could definitely spend all day on, you know, just making every little hair. Um, but for this level of sketch, it's just if you throw in a few key strokes here and there, it'll it'll get the message across. So I don't want to focus too much on stuff like that because it's not as important to the structure or the likeness. He has some neck stubble too, so it's not as it's not as readily visible here. But uh, that's something I want to include in a in a drawing. All right, I, I am pretty happy with how this is going, so it's looking good. I think that's a satisfactory rough sketch. Uh, this paper does smudge a bit, though. Keep that in mind if you work on anything like vellum. Uh, but yeah, I think I'm gonna go ahead and take this, keep it in mind, and I'm gonna go ahead and draw the body now. Because that is the next important thing to tackle, and I don't talk about that a lot in my, um, there's one lesson on it in the Proco Caricature course. 
Let's see. Red says, trying to be honest with myself on whether a caricature is really successful is something I've been trying to develop as a habit lately. Trying to avoid being lazy, I suppose. Yeah. Uh, seems like that the filtrum is a lot bigger, but I might be wrong. It, that's totally valid if you want to make a longer filtrum or a shorter filtrum. I don't know if you mean mine is too bigger. It's too big. But that's that's valid. Um, everyone has their own way of seeing it. Um, Paul says, do you use negative spaces as in portraiture, for example, in caricature at all, or do you only focus on more obvious features? I think negative space becomes more important when you're talking about the body and also multiple figures interacting because then you're negative space has more to do I think with composition than you know really likeness or caricature and uh, Lorenzo says what's the most important part in a caricature when you do a strong caricature which is the part that has to be very similar to the reference you know that's a hard question to answer and it's different for everybody it's, it's different for every subject that you draw there's people whose certain features are going to be more important that you get just right and other people where it's not quite as important and I know that's, that's kind of a weird thing to say, but, or, or if, I don't know if you really understand that, but for some people it's really important to just nail the features because they have a very bland head shape. And for other people they have a very distinct head shape that if you, if you don't do the exaggeration of the head shape correctly, it, it'll fail. But then you can also maybe not spend as, or worry about the features so much because they have such a distinctive head shape. So it's, it's, it, that's one of the things that makes caricature really difficult. <laughs> So anyway, let's, um, oh, you know, this is not the uh, vellum. That's the uh, Bristol paper. I'm going to continue drawing on the vellum because I really like the feel of it. Okay. So I'm going to mark off where the top is, where I want to do the top of the head, and then I don't really see the feet. Um, let me go ahead and zoom back out of my photo reference here. Okay, yeah, that's all of the body that I see. It's down to basically his knee, so that'll be just about uh, just about down here because I don't want to go off the edge of the paper from where you guys can see it. So I like to establish the top and the bottom of my figure so it'll help keep me on track. I do that a lot with realistic figure drawing because proportions are more important, but for here it's just more for compositional purposes. Uh, and the first thing I want to establish is the movement or the gesture of the pose or how it flows and I love this photo because of the really really pronounced uh, body movement that's happening here you can't have a stance that's more energetic and movement oriented than this it's the classic uh, contrapposto pose where the hips and the shoulders are um, set against one another that's what contrapposto means I guess set against or a pose that's against itself I don't know Italian or Latin but so the shoulders are going to be one way, and the hips are going to be another. And then the movement that connects them, that's the gesture, flow of the pose. The head's pretty much straight up and down, but the spine's going to kind of curve that way out to the hips, and then sh jut rapidly back to the right to form this S-curve. And that basically represents the center, the center line of the body out to the far hip over here. And this is going to be the weight-bearing leg, the, the the leg on the left. The leg on the right is not going to be the weight-bearing leg, so it's going to just fall off to the distance here, for, and uh, it's going to be at a more um, more of an angle than the uh, the weight that's actually supporting the head weight or the weight of the body. So it's really important that the body has flow and movement to it. I'm exaggerating the pose, but I'm now also thinking about exaggerating the forms or the anatomy. That's the secondary thing. But the first thing I think is exaggerating the motion of the pose. And like in a caricature, you want to think about heightening the action as much as possible. And the head, I'm not sure. The head may be small or maybe bigger than this. I'm not going to, this isn't going to be my final caricature here. What I'm going to probably do is if this body drawing ends up being successful, I'll probably scan the two images and compile them together digitally and finish it that way. Or I could do it where I would uh, maybe compile them digitally, like paste them together, and then reproject that onto another big piece of paper. But I'm treating the head and the body differently in this because I have such different goals in each. 
So he has these like arms that are so long and thin and it's the length of the arms is sort of exaggerated by the fact that he has these really short sleeves. So it maybe looks it makes it makes it look like his arms are even longer than they are with sort of large hands. This is going to be the hands here. There we go. See, Paul says, what type of paper do you prefer? And do you prefer charcoal or graphite? Um, I prefer charcoal generally for doing drawings just because it's, uh, I can get what I want so much quicker. Um, you know, I can shade in really easily with it and get a dark value and lift things out pretty easily. Pencil's definitely a different beast, but they're related. Um, I just wanted to try a pencil drawing today just because I don't do it that often. Um, but yeah, I generally prefer charcoal, charcoal pencils. Uh, it's midnight there, and you'll see the rest tomorrow. Thanks for joining us, Hossein. Uh, let's see, Paul says, is it me or would you, or would young Clint be a fantastic Wolverine? <laughs> yeah, yeah, definitely. Um, it's not just you. I think people have maybe even said that before. Is there a Riley abstraction for the body for, as there is for the head? Yes, Riley did make a body rhythm abstraction, and you could probably find that online somewhere. Um, I didn't teach it, uh, but I did learn about it at the Watts Atelier. They taught it there, and they have online classes. It's probably the best place to learn that, actually. <laughs> um, Uncle Rizzo says, I always thought Mel Gibson would have made a great Wolverine. Yeah, yeah, maybe back in the day. Okay, so the, this great uh, 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 poncho he's wearing is really cool. It's part of the pose, I think, as well, and helps balance the figure. Creates a nice triangular shape. I went up a little bit higher than I wanted, but that's all right. Okay, so I've got the gesture of the pose. This is the critical part here. This is, I think, the thing that will make or break the pose. If you don't have the gesture and the rhythm down, yeah, it's going to fail. Uh, but I like the dynamic quality. I like the proportions that I've uh, chosen here. So what I want to do now is just start you know, bringing out basically just the anatomy of the clothing and the folds, because that's what we see. Um, I didn't really focus too much on any actual anatomy, like, you know, the, the pectoralis and the deltoids, anything like that. It's really just not that important. It's more important to get the gesture of the body here because it's, it's not a nude. You know, the structure of the body definitely does inform how the clothing hangs and where the tension points are. Um, but really, I don't need to waste a lot of time doing any kind of real anatomy on this. Lewis says, ever plan on doing some traditional painting caricatures? Um, yeah, that's that's in the wheelhouse. Um, that's a different kind of setup for my live stream. I might do that I have to figure out the best way to tackle that. Uh, Matt says, how long did I spend at Watts? Uh, I was there for about nine years, almost 10 years, uh, taking and teaching classes. I, I taught classes for about two years, and then they asked me to start teaching caricature there. And I just continued uh, my traditional art education while I was there, just um, taking more figure drawing, head drawing, landscape painting, anatomy, color theory, concept design. I just took all these great classes. The, uh, the, the chance, the, the fact that I had uh, this job teaching there meant basically I could just trade my teaching pay back in for classes. Uh, so it allowed me to continue going there for quite a while. What type of paper do I prefer, if any? Um, you know, it just depends on the day. Today I prefer this. <laughs> Uh, this this vellum paper is really cool. Um, it just it takes the pencil really nicely. Uh, but if I was working with graph, you know, with the uh, sorry charcoal, uh, smooth newsprint, of course, is the way to go. Um, the Bristol board is good. Bristol not Bristol board, Bristol paper, um, like that uh, 
smooth pen that Borden, smooth pen paper that Borden and Riley makes. I do a lot of drawings on that. Uh, but I usually, you know, when I draw on that, I usually have the intention of inking it later. So that's why I do them on that paper. If you're just sketching, sketching, any paper really is good. There's really no bad paper to sketch on, honestly. You know, I was wondering, um, looking at this photo, studying it, about the uneven buttoning of this vest here, how this side's lower on that side, and I thought, oh, you know what? I bet that's a character choice he made because his gun's on that side, and he's gonna, he'll need quick access uh, to draw his gun. So he didn't want the uh, vest on the right side to be too low and block his access to the gun. I'm like, yeah, that's something that the guns, a gunslinger like that would probably do. He doesn't care about how it looks, about how it makes him look uneven or sloppy. So I'm thinking that's intentional for the character. Peace. Thanks for joining. Yeah, I hope you can catch the rest of the stream later. Yes, Protik, I, I will definitely keep on doing more live streams as long as I uh, can, as long as I have time. That's one thing about the pandemic is giving me a bit of extra time. So skinny legs, I think, are fitting for his character. Pretty thin, tall guy, so... Uh, see, Lorenzo says, thanks for the answer. Can caricature help in the study of anatomy, or is it something that is better when you already know the basis of it? Because it's very interesting. Um, no, I don't think caricature in particular helps you understand anatomy any better. I think it can help you draw it better, but the true understanding of an anatomy, as far as like knowing what's going on with the body, I think comes with the diligent study of realistic anatomy, like understanding where the muscles attach to the bones, understanding how they group together to form the masses, and all that should be studied, I think, from a traditional point of view, personally. Um, but once you know it, you once you have that knowledge, it can definitely make your caricatures better. And having good anatomical knowledge makes, yeah, it makes your caricatures, I think, stronger because you're you're um, drawing from a a real well of knowledge there on what's actually happening, and you're just choosing now what to do with that knowledge in your drawings you're making it exaggerated but um you can definitely still do decent caricatures without good anatomical knowledge because there's a lot of styles you can work in in caricature and and they can look compelling and good and you can sort of fake it you know if you have decent enough photo reference in caricature uh, because you're changing the subject so much from what is really there however if your anatomy knowledge is so bad and ignorant and, and you're still trying to do good anatomy in your drawings it, it'll become obvious i think and it'll hurt you so if you want to be the type of artist that um has really good anatomy in their drawings and i don't yeah you just you, you do have to study it and it's a it's a big subject i haven't even fully studied the anatomy of the figure the face yes the face and head but um i have a lot of gaps in my knowledge when it comes to anatomy i, I mean i've drawn a lot of figures from life i took anatomy courses at watts and I'm sure some, a lot of it's sunk in and it's still there in my brain somewhere, but like I can't recite to you all the muscles and muscle groups. I, I know some of them, uh, but uh, yeah, I don't, I, I never really burned it into my brain or that anatomical knowledge that I really should have. I will one day. For most work, like this kind of thing, uh, I think it's really important to be able to do convincing clothing and folds in the drapery um, because you're going to be doing that more than anything. You almost never do nude caricatures of anyone. <laughs> um, 
the occasion you might have the occasion to sometime. Like I think I did a uh, Harvey Weinstein a couple of years ago for a client where he was uh, just in his underwear uh, and a tank top. But uh, anatomical knowledge, you know, the little that I do have uh, definitely helped with that. Although they ended up not using that, um, they scrapped the story or they, they paid me for it, but they ended up saying, oh yeah, we're not going to use the uh, Weinstein illustration for whatever reason. Oh, I don't think it was because of the quality of the drawing. I mean, I think it was pretty good, honestly, but uh, yeah, I think they just went in a different direction with the story. Uh, Uncle Rizzo says, was it difficult switching to digital art? Any advice or tips would really help? Um, a big subject, a big question there. Um, drawing on you know, on a tablet screen, you know, I, I drew on an Intuos for years without being able to look at the screen, and I got used to it. But I think it is a lot easier to make the transition to digital if you do get a screen that you can draw on, whether it's an iPad or uh, you know something like a Wacom connected to a computer. So... Uh, that's one bit of advice, I guess. And, uh, you know, keep it simple. Just uh, don't try to get too fancy with it. Just learn the basics of the uh, how the program works and how the brushes work, how to customize them to get exactly what you need. Uh, so things like Procreate, other programs like that for the iPad, I think do a much better job out of the box of being ready to go uh, you know, for an artist. Uh, with Photoshop, which I use primarily, um, it, you know, I, I had a lot of training in it beforehand before I even like thought about using it for digital painting I learned Photoshop in college just because I wanted to know it because in case I ever needed to manipulate photos for whatever reason I didn't know that it, at the time that it could be used for digital painting but since I was so familiar with it already and it's and how it worked I ended up just using it as my default program for uh, for painting and there weren't a lot of options back then there was Photoshop and Corel and that was pretty much it now there's a lot of options Uh, back then, Harvey Weinstein was protected by really powerful people. Well, this was after his downfall, actually. It was a story about him being the creep that he is, um, and then he had not didn't have any power at that point. <laughs> it was a magazine being very critical of him, and yeah, he was, um, you know, deservedly so. <laughs> but I'm not sure, yeah, why exactly. I think, yeah, I don't know if they ended up just using a photo or what. But it wasn't because he was powerful and you know got the story squashed or anything like that because yeah, he was already in trouble at that point. There's this cast shadow on his vest from his arm which further reinforces the fact that there's definitely a strong light source strong light source coming from the uh, right side. Hand anatomy, though, that's definitely going to be important to a caricaturist. So don't neglect your uh, study of your hand anatomy because you draw hand. You're going to be drawing hands all the time uh, for caricature jobs because they're really, really expressive and they help tell the story of what's going on uh, in combination with the face and whatever else is happening up on the head. The hands are the next important thing. So you think about it, hands are sort of the uh, how we manifest our will into this world. The hands are what operates machinery. It's what every you know everything is every action is completed by our hands pretty much. So uh, yeah, they're going to be drawn a lot, and you learn have to learn how to draw them, you know, and how to caricature them confidently. And this is just a real quick light sketch. It's not really an anatomical study, but uh, hopefully 
it feels kind of com competent enough. So I just want the major, um, you know, wrinkles and folds in the clothing here. That's sort of what I'm after at this stage. You know, if it turns out well enough, I think this could be something I could, you know, turn into a painting from this stage, you know, or maybe I could refine it a little bit more. But uh, if I have all the major bits of uh, clothing folds, that's really all you need, really. If it looks anatomically correct and if it, uh, the weight distribution feels good and it feels balanced. That's uh, that's the goal. Proteek says it would be helpful if you have a video about pencil strokes or tones. No, I don't specifically deal with that in any of my videos, but there are some videos on the Proco YouTube channel that deal with some basic pencil issues about how to shade forms, even like just how to hold the pencil, how to sharpen it, you know, what we use the pencil, how we use the pencil in different ways. Um, so check that out. It's, I don't know if it's in the, there's like a drawing basics playlist, I think on the Proco YouTube channel. So yeah, maybe check that out. Okay, so yeah, that's kind of the basics here for this uh, this sketch. Here's the um, body next to the head I've chosen. Yeah, I think the head needs some work. It still feels a little, I don't know, a little sloppy, a little clumsy. Uh, maybe could use another level of refinement. Uh, so that would probably be my next stage. But then after that, I would combine these two digitally and put you know the finished head on that body. Uh, because, you know, I I liked having the big space, the big open space on this paper to work and figure these things out. If I were to try to draw this head, you know, only, but only like two or three inches big, then that could be a little, uh, I wouldn't necessarily be able to get the results that I wanted. Now let's see if there's any last minute questions here, because that's pretty much all I've got for you today. Uh, let's see, you love the stance. Thanks, Stan. Uh, Paul says, you seem to switch in the way you grip your pencil. Any tips on that? Yeah, I think generally when I'm doing bigger motions, I switch to the underhand grip um, where I'm holding it more like a uh, like a butter knife, like I'm buttering my bread with a knife, that sort of stroke, because it involves the entire shoulder. I can get better gesture, and better movement in the form when I'm doing that. But when I want to really do uh, more detailed work, like focus on cross hatching or smaller features, then I'll switch over to the overhand or I, I don't know, I think it's called the tripod grip by some. Uh, but yeah, I'm always going back and forth between these two grips and I, I just do it unconsciously because I just it's more comfortable to me to do bigger shapes with the overhand grip and, and more gestural flowing lines that way. But if you try to do that with this grip, like the letter, the letter writing grip, like we learned when we were children, uh, you're not going to necessarily get as good results. It can be done. You know, it's not like you have to always use one or the other. But I think it's important to be able to switch because you can also get really great uh you know, strokes with the side of the pencil if you hold it lower like this with the underhand grip. That's another thing when you're shading is when you want to switch to that grip, I think. Yeah, so let's see. Um, any other? Yep, many thanks for today's demo. You're welcome. Thank you, Red. Um, yeah, I guess that's basically it for now. So um, thanks for joining me this week. Um, if you have any additional questions, let me know in the comments. 
And uh, yeah, I guess I'll see you all next week with a new topic.